the cloud, you'll probably get a message. And here we go. We're going to be working on beetroots, carrots. We'll see how much time we have. I've also prepared eggplants and avocados if we've still got lots of time. Don't kick the table, Caroline, because you shake the camera. Oh, this is hard. So here I have my little collection on my table, my uh, beetroot that I dug up from the garden so we can have a look at the colors. And um, I noticed, especially in my photograph, that there's a lot of like raw sienna color on the top of a uncooked beetroot. You don't see that once they've been cooked and obviously when they've been peeled. But I thought that was kind of nice little addition if we were painting that to pop that in, especially if they're dry like this, they really, we're gonna put more color in them. And uh, I have a few photographs here. I photographed them when I dug them up before I ate them. And there's a few of those here. I didn't, I didn't send those, but I'm happy to send them if people would like them. And the first thing we're going to do is work in your uh, practice book or on your practice paper. And at first, I just want to mix some colors, different violet mixes to get you used to not just using one color out of a tube when you paint something, but using a variety of colors or your color out of the tube mixed with other colors. So you get some beautiful variety in your painting. And then we're going to just work on painting something that's round by going in your brush strokes in a round direction and having a hard highlight, which is dry paper and a soft highlight, which is wet paper. So just a few things before we get going. Like I said, it's really nice to warm up to painting. So the first thing I want to do is I don't have many violets in my tray. I only really like the dioxazine violet. That's the only one that, that I, I can't mix. It's too bright and vibrant. I can't mix it and I love it. So I usually start with that violet when I'm um, starting in something in violet, make sure I've got one here. I've got different makes. I really love the Windsor and Newton one. And then Core has a gorgeous one. So this is my Core one. Very, very translucent, very vibrant. Uh, great for mixing. It, on, on the camera, I'm noticing it looks a bit more blue than it actually looks on my paper. The other one, which is much gentler, is Windsor Violet, made with made by Windsor and Newton. I have to just look for it in here. Uh, there it is, Windsor Violet. It's a more gentle violet, and you probably could mix this with ultramarine blue and another color. It doesn't stain as much. It's not as vibrant. So if you wanted a much more gentle violet, the Windsor Violet is very pretty. Another one I used to buy is... Uh, Theo violet, but if you mix a pink with with one of these violets, you get a Theo violet anyway. But it is a it is a pretty one. I don't have one right here, I don't think. So I've just got those two violets here, and now let's mix the di diox dioxazine violet with some ultramarine blue, so you can see what it looks like when you put some blue with it. So if you have one. If you don't have one, don't worry, we're going to mix some actual violets. But if you do have one, get your dioxazine violet and add some ultramarine blue to it. So you're making it more blue, not too much more blue, but taking a little bit of that violet edge off of it. And then let's put it here and see what it looks like. I'm looking at my computer screen and mine looks way more blue on the computer screen than it does in front of me. So um, I don't know if that is showing up on your screen a little bit more like that. I'm adding a little bit more de-violet to violet it up on my second strokes. And then I'm gonna add a bit more ultramarine blue. So I've got a few different colors all in one square. And that's sort of what we want to be going for when we paint something like the beetroot. We don't want it all over one color. We want to have other colors coming in and blending wet in wet. So you have a variety of colors all in one object. Now I'm going to go down the page. So the, this next one here is ultramarine blue with a permanent rose. So this is now mixing your own violets. So I'm going to get my ultramarine blue. I did clean up my palette before we started. 
So my ultramarine blue, and then I have a Winsor & Newton permanent rose here. Really pretty color, probably my favorite color in the in the cool pinks. And I'm mixing that until I get a violet color. And I'm putting this here. And I'm gonna add a little bit more rose to that, just a little bit more rose, and then a little bit more rose. So you can see that there's a variety of violets you can mix from a very blue violet to a very rosish sort of a violet. Ultramarine blue is a very gentle color. It's not going to mix you a, a really sort of strong violet like the dioxazine violet. It's a warm blue. So mixing it with a cool pink is going to give you a good combination. But when you mix a cool blue and a cool pink, you get a more vibrant combination. So we're going to try that with the thalo blue. The thalo blue is a vibrant, cool blue. And I have to find mine. It's in the other, in my other one. Here it is. Well, here's my, now thalo blue is like a turquoisey blue. It has more green and yellow in it, and it's very vibrant. And we're going to mix that with the permanent rose. Oh, I'm going to put that in the wrong one. Concentrate. Here we go. You can already see, I think, just looking at my palette from the ultramarine blue violet to the one with the thalo blue. The thalo blue one is extremely dark and vibrant, almost like the dioxazine violet. So I'm going to put that down. Strangely, when I put it on the paper, it's not quite as vibrant as in the palette. And I'm also going to do the same thing. I'm going to add a little bit more rose, permanent rose to it, to go across looking from a blue violet to a more rose violet. And this one here is pretty much what you'd get if you had a Theo violet from the tube, which is a very uh, warm, not warm, yeah, a warm violet. If you would say the more reddish ones are a warm violet, the more bluish ones are a cool violet. And you may not have a quinacridone magenta. You might have some other kind of magenta. You might just have a magenta hue. If you don't have these colors, don't worry. If you have another similar color in your palette, then you can try that out for yourself. Just make a note. This is my quinacridone magenta from Quor. It's a very, very deep magenta, like almost like red wine. A staining color very vibrant. I'm always scared to use it because once you get it on your paper, that's that's it. You're committed. And I'm going to do, mix that with my thalo blue. Two very, very strong, very staining colors. And I want to mix it till it makes a gorgeous violet and try that one out. Now that is very close, very close to a dioxazine violet. I would say as close as I've ever got. It really just proves that you don't need to buy a lot of paint to mix colors. You need a cool and a warm of everything. You can't mix colors unless you have your primaries in cool and warm of each primary. And then your earth colors, your burnt sienna and raw sienna, those are your two earth colors. So we've got a really beautiful range of violets here. And of course, when we're talking about beetroot, we want to go to the much warmer ones where we add more rose or more alizarin and crimson. On this side, we're now going to use the dioxazine violet to mix it into some colors that might be good for beetroot or eggplant or any of those vegetables or plants that have a lot of red or violet in them. So let's go back to my... Mm -hmm. Where's my palette? Here's my D violet. There we go. So we're going to map uh, the dioxazine violet with the ultramarine blue, blue, which I already had here, and then some quinacridone magenta if you have it. And if you don't, don't worry. It's not one that you have to have. It came in a box of paints my daughter gave me as a gift some core paints. And like I said, I don't use it very often because it's it's scary intense, but beautiful. Oh my goodness, look at that color. 
and again, you may not see it as beautiful as I'm seeing it right in front of me on the paper. It's much more intense than when I look up at my screen. Gorgeous pinky color. The second one, I'm going to do Prussian blue. We haven't gone into Prussian blue yet in permanent road. Now, Prussian is another of those cool blues. You could use it instead of thalo blue if you didn't have one. It's a bit darker than thalo blue. I'm just going to make sure I'm actually in my Prussian there. All my words of, of um, I know that one is. My little words on my tray have worn off. Yeah, that was Prussian. So Prussian blue. So it's a dark greenish blue, not as intense as thalo blue, but definitely one of those cool blues. And we're going to mix that with permanent rose, which is not as bright as the magenta. And I'm going to go heavy on the rose. So we're going more into like the beetroot sort of colors. And these are great for putting your shadows on your beetroot. Now we're going to use phthalo blue with alizarin crimson. I'm going to end up with no space on my palette, aren't I? So uh, phthalo blue, oh, just, just look how bright that color is. And then I have some alizarin crimson right here. I tend not to use my alizarin all that much anymore. I tend to go to the permanent rose, but it is still a truly beautiful color. I'm gonna put lots because we're talking beetroot here. I wanna go into the real, oh, that's almost black, a bit more crimson. Bit more crimson, bit more water. And it gives it that brownie sort of color, that brownie reddish, deep reddish color that's great for the, the shadows. And of course, alizarin crimson by itself, I'm just going to put some here, is really a great beetroot color. And I think that's one color that comes closer than any other to a beetroot color which is why I think if you have one, it's a good one to use. Permanent rose, just grab some permanent rose, put that here. Permanent rose is pretty close. And, and I have a very good quality artist permanent rose. So it's extremely strong and vibrant. Both of them are lovely for beetroot. And you can see how if you use the phthalo blue and alizarin crimson for your darks, maybe with some ultramarine blue, it's going to work really well. The last one is Prussian blue and quinacridone magenta. So the Prussian blue doesn't make, it's not as vibrant. And all of these make very acceptable violets. And there we go, this is my last one, Prussian blue and quinacridone magenta. Oh, you have a whole range here. Label them if you do them so that in the future when they're dry and you have a look at them, you know what they look like when they're dry and what the mixes look like. And really you can see that you don't need to buy a tube of violet unless you really want to. You can mix a huge variety of beautiful violets as long as you have, I would say, a cool blue and a cool pink. The two cool colors together make some beautiful, beautiful uh, violets. I really like this one, the Prussian blue and the quinacridone magenta here. They're starting to separate and granulate. They look rather pretty. Mm. Okay, let's put that to one side. And we're going to practice before we start what we're going to do. Just going to have a look at have my notes right beside me. Here they are. Move them. I have everything really, really organized. And then I move something and I'm I'm uh, all in pieces. Alizarin, crimson, and Prussian blue. That's the one that I used for most of the beetroot. So the alizarin is and a bit heavier on the alizarin. So let's go back to I know. <laughs> if you look at your palette and I look at mine, I just got violet all over the place. I don't know which one was the, oh yeah, I think it was this one. Or which one was the alizarin and Prussian? I'm pretty sure it's this one here. I'll just mix up a bit more, clean those up. Okay, I'm pretty sure it was this one. So I don't want too much Prussian in that. I just put a little bit more in there. 
I want a lot of alizarin. I want this to be, you know, a red to start with, and then I can add the blue and the ultramarine later to put shadows. So I'm getting a lot more alizarin in there. And like I say, if you don't have alizarin, use permanent rose or magenta. And I don't know what else you might have in your palette, but if it says rose, it should work. And if you don't have Prussian blue, use phthalo blue or Windsor blue. Or if you don't have any of those blues, find something that worked in your little mix there and add a bit more rose so it's nice and reddish like the beetroot. Now, we're not going to do any of the color mixing for this one. We're just going to do how do you, I'm going to zoom in just a little bit. How do you paint something that's round and how do you make it look round? The first thing you need to do is have a light side and a dark side and and have shading to make it look round. So shading on this side and highlight on this side. You also need to follow, as you paint, follow the shape that you're painting. Don't, if you're painting something round, don't paint up and down with up and down straight strokes because that will at some point show and confuse the viewer. If you want a nice, hard, dry highlight, I suggest penciling it in. Now I put it in in pen so you can see it, but I would suggest just penciling in where you want your highlight. And with clean water, around that highlight, not on it, you have to keep it dry, put some water so this side is going to be a bit lighter when you put your paint on because you've got water just here. And then load up your brush with your color. I've got my beetroot color here. And I'm going to start at the bottom. The bottom is always going to be the darkest place. It's closest to the, the surface and furthest from the light. So start from the bottom and curl your brush strokes around the beetroot. So you're painting in the direction of the vegetable. And once you get up to this little highlight, you can just vary your stroke for a moment so you can go around it with your brush. And this is my cheap paper, so it's not going to behave as nicely as my good paper. I'm going to go up here for the, if you notice, all of the leaves that come off of the beetroot are a very dark red and even the veins up on the leaves. So we're taking that up and the the little roots are fun. They're just a, a fun feature. I mean, you may cut them off, but I think sometimes the fun features are great to keep on there or add. Now, this is just a ba very basic shape. And one of the things you can do with that highlight, which is all filled in now, is use a thirsty brush. That's one of the things I want to practice this week. A thirsty brush means a brush that's been cleaned in water and then almost dried on a paper towel or a uh, ordinary towel. And then you use it like a sort of a little vacuum cleaner and you suck up a little bit of the paint with it. it oh, I've got my hand in everything now. Every time you do that, you wipe the paint off. You should actually clean your brush and wipe the paint off, but I get lazy and I'm sure everybody gets lazy. And you can pull back a little of that highlight when you do that and don't smudge it like I did here with my hand. And that way you can make it look more round, but these highlights are what we're gonna practice here, which are soft highlights. While this is still wet, I'm going to add some ultramarine blue over here. Still see my palette, make sure you can see my palette. And I'll add a little bit of that beetroot color to it. And we're going to do the charging. Remember last week we learned charging. And if this is still wet, you can charge in a little bit of that dark color on the side away from the light. And that will, that will flow into the paint. It looks much more ratty as I'm looking at my computer screen than it does just right here. You don't want to do too much charging because sometimes it will all blend into everything and you'll end up again with one 
solid color. So I think that's the limit, especially for this paper. The next layer of shadow would be done on dry paint. It really looks beautiful when you have dry um, paint over dry paint. You get that layered look of different levels. So while that's just soaking into the paper, let's try on this side the soft highlight. So what you do with the soft highlight is with very clean water, and I've got two pots of water here, one that's got all my violet colors in and one that's clean. With clean water, I'm wetting this side of the beetroot. And again, getting my beetroot color, mixing up a bit more. Love that alizarin for beetroot color. It really is perfect. So again, we want to start from the bottom, Caroline, like you told everybody to, and go around in a round motion around the beetroot. Because if you ever see your brush strokes, if they show up, they'll be going in the correct direction for the vegetable. Go around until you hit the water. And of course, I'm going up here at the same time so that I've got this all happening with the wet and down through the root. And going up till I hit the water this side. And I definitely need an edge. The edge on the highlight side will be much lighter than, of course, than the dark edge, but you still need to have one. And I'm cleaning my brush and I'm just going to soften that in with a wet brush, just pull it in. And if my paint overtakes too much, we do the thirsty brush again. Remember, clean brush, dry it off. It's going to be like a little vacuum cleaner, dry it off and just pull the paint back if it's flowing too much, just gently. I'm not washing it in between. I'm just, I'm drying it on my cloth. I find washing it in between, though you should really, sometimes it just puts too much water on your painting. And as long as you're doing an okay job like this, that's okay. So we're gonna be using this method as well as this method. We're gonna be using both to get a sort of a soft area of highlight. And I really exaggerated this and a hard area of highlight. I think on this one, the soft, the soft highlight looks beautiful. So if you just have a little tiny hard highlight and the rest lovely and soft, it's gonna look beautiful. I will add a little more, I'm gonna add some Prussian blue to that, some more little bit of alizarin to the dark. So I've made a different dark, Prussian and alizarin rather than ultramarine. And this is still a little bit wet here. As long as it's wet, I can charge in some color. It, it won't happen. As soon as the wet starts to dissipate, you won't get your paint charging. It will just sit there and you'll have a, a, a line happening. Mine's almost, almost too dry. Uh, it will just charge in a little bit. I want to put a little bit up here. And remember, this is our practice. This is not our finished one. And in, in real life, when you have the shadow side, you always have a tiny bit of reflected light on the shadow side. So this little glimmer here on the edge would be lighter than the actual shadow. That makes things look round too. And I'm struggling now. This is not wet enough to blend this in. I'm really struggling to blend that little bit in. But you see, this charge is actually blending in quite nicely. I could maybe get just the tiniest bit more under here, just here. And that's it. I don't want to charge any more there. It's going to be too, too dry to do that. This side. This paper too um, dries very quickly. It doesn't absorb the paint. So you really don't get the great look that you can get on good paper. If you want to do the lovely little hairy roots, you need a very thin brush. Just looking for my really thin uh, liner brush. 
and I want to wet it so it's it will take up the paint and get some beetroot color. And when you do the little hairy roots, it's like doing the branches last week we did on the trees. You just kind of use that brush and wiggle some some lovely little tiny roots coming off of there. Oh, one other thing I want to show you before we start, and you may not have a spray bottle. Um, I have I have one here that I got in the art store. I think it was about five dollars. It's specifically made for spraying water or paint. I have a bottle I got in the dollar store yesterday. It was filled with 70% alcohol. So I put all the alcohol in a different bottle and use this because it's the same price to buy an empty bottle as one filled with alcohol. And I didn't have many empty bottles. So I got some of those. There's many different makes that you can get. There's these little tiny bottles that you can get as well to mist your painting. But here's something I just want to do. And what I'd like to try on the painting today, if you have a spray bottle, spray, just lightly spray your paper really lightly. And then when you use your paint to come up and do the leaves, this is like if we we're coming up to do the leaves, you can pull your brush up through that randomly sprayed paper like this. Keep a little bit that's dry at the bottom, or you can put it on later when it's dry. And then just leave that. Look how that's making that, that veined look for the leaf, just using the sprayed water. Now, you can't get that effect with a brush. If you brush the water on, you won't get that effect because it won't be random. And you might get it with a sponge, but it is best with a light spray from a spray bottle. So you may not have one, but if you do, um, if at any point while we're chatting or painting, you can find a little, little bit, it doesn't have to be any size bottle, as long as you can do just two squirts on your paper with that and have it, it's one of those loose things. It gives you some lovely uh, loose, like loose lines as the paint sort of flows into that spray. And if you can keep it dry here by putting a paper towel or a piece of paper on it, that's really helpful too. Maybe a little bit too much on this one, a little better on this one. When it's dry, you can tighten all that detail up. When this is all dry, I could go back in and I could put some much stronger veins in there, but I don't need to do that until that's that's all dry. And I'm looking at this one. This one's too wet to show the second layer. I'm just going to grab the one I have over here that I did a couple of years ago. So this one's in my journal. And that's where I keep a lot of my little watercolors if I don't, you know, don't know what to do with them. I have a little journal I pop them in. This one was done very, very quickly and loosely. Different, different to this one, which is done with a lot more care and more slowly. So I don't know if you want to practice both today or if you want me to show you both. It's kind of fun to have different techniques, but this one is where I've put layer over layer and you can see the hard edge of the second layer of paint. And this one, there's three, three layers. You can see the hard edges. They're messy and they're not that planned. I just sort of put them on quickly but you can see the difference between having the soft edges sort of um, softened in with a wet brush and painted carefully to very fast and layers of color. So different, just different techniques. This one has no black lines around the edge. This one, I made black lines with this bamboo pen, which was only two or $3 from iron oxide. She usually has lots of them and they're not very expensive, fun to use. What I love about the bamboo pen is it gives you a very different sized lines, very uh, loose lines where we're working on loose. But there's a selection of other pens you can use. We'll talk about those later. So let's pop that one over here. I'm going to zoom back out for a minute. Did I zoom out or zoom in? I don't know. I think I zoomed in. There we go. 
And I'm going to get my paper. I haven't drawn my, I drew my carrots already, but I didn't draw my beets because I thought we could go over that together. I did draw a practice one somewhere. So here is a real beetroot. They are just a very simple shape to draw. So you should be, and they come in every shape. You know, that's, you don't have to have it equal. It doesn't have to be equal on both sides. You don't have to have it this shape. Should be a fairly easy thing to draw. So let's, let's go ahead and try it. I kind of liked having two on here for composition. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of one, one thing on the paper, but sometimes I, I do do just one thing and that's, that's okay. Just, so I always want to put something else in there. And also, I'm also a big fan of not having everything showing. You notice the side of the beetroot's missing here and the side of the beetroot's missing here. I kind of like that look. So if you want to do that look, you're welcome to. If you don't, if you just want to do one beetroot in the middle, go for it. Now let's put our beetroot in. And I put the beetroot down kind of low to give myself a bit of room for the leaves. And I've taken a liberty because actually, if I was going to put the real length of the stems in and the leaves, I'd never have, I'd have to make a very teeny beetroot, and very, very long stems. I've shortened them and taken artistic liberty with it. So that's what I wanted was a beetroot that was big enough to actually get a good amount of paint on it. And it's going to sketch that in. I like to use one of these little mechanical pencils to sketch. They don't make a very hard, and they don't make a thick, messy line. I want the root, I like diagonals. I'm gonna have the, the root kind of coming off at a diagonal. The, put the, the uh, leaf the stems up here, just going sort of out. And again, I want one up here. I may not do this one exactly like this picture. I may do it a little bit differently. Have this one a bit smaller. And again, the, the stems coming up here. And then I just, I want to just clean up my little white eraser, just clean up my pencil lines a little bit. Make sure I don't have any eraser mess on there. And then I'm going to get started. I will start with the one in the foreground. And I do want to have a little bit of a, a dry, just a tiny dry highlight. It's really tiny. I didn't have one in here. I want to... If you don't draw something like that in, you, you lose it. You forget to keep it. It gets lost, but I also want to have a soft highlight. So I'm going to wet and wet around that so I can have some soft highlight too, as well as the hard highlight. And I love this kind of raw sienna effect on the top of the beetroot. So I wet that here as well. And I'm going to start at the top with the raw sienna. Bring my raw sienna over here. I want to put that so it's going to blend wet in wet with my beetroot color, mostly on my right side here. So it's going to bleed down into that water that I've put on there. And I can actually, if I want to wet this part so it's bleeding before I get to the beetroot color. I'm going to use the alizarin crimson with a little bit of um, Prussian blue in there. A lot of alizarin. And remember, paint more alizarin, Caroline. Paint around the beetroot. Paint around it. Pull your brush around. And stop when you get to the water that you put there. And around. You may remember you had a dry space here too. You can make sure you get some color 
on the edge and close to the dry spot. Let that bleed up into that raw sienna. If your paint's wet enough, it should all keep bleeding and moving. I'm going to use, I'm using my number eight brush, which has a lovely point. If you don't have a good point on your brush, if, you, if your brush hasn't got a good point, switch to a smaller brush if you don't have a good point and use the point of your smaller brush to pull down your root paint. I want to take it right down and going out the paper and I want it to split here. Don't always have to do what your beetroot does. You can look at all the beetroot pictures and beetroots and make up your mind what you want for your painting. What, what look do you want to make your painting look how you want it? Now, I just need to get water on my brush now, cleaning my brush. And I want to just with a little bit of water on it, I just want to tease that color up into the highlighted area. You don't want a lot of water on your brush. I've got a towel here, so I don't have too much so that I don't put a whole bunch of water on there. Gently, very gently. And if you find that your paint is coming way too much into your water, do the thirsty brush. Remember, wash your brush, get it nice and clean, get it fairly dry and pull the paint back a little bit if you feel that it's come too far into the color. Don't do that everywhere because you want this beautiful dark color in other places. But if you feel that it got too close to your, your highlight here, just gently pull it back. Now, I, I don't want, you remember I did the spray thing? I don't want to do any spray thing here. While this is wet, I could accidentally spray it. If I cover it up, I'm going to smudge it. So we're going to leave that technique until this area is all dry. Mine is drying up a little bit too much to charge with darker color. I'm going to get a little bit of ultramarine blue and a little bit of Prussian, a little bit of alizarin. And I'm going to try. Oh, it's Yeah, it's still wet enough down here. You, if something's shiny, it's wet enough. As it starts to go dull, as it starts to lose that shine, it's not wet enough. And I'm charging in there, just really gently touching some dark. And if I touch that to the root, it will flow down the root too. I want more dark on this side, but I can't put that in right now. It's too dry. I can put that in with the second layer. That will be fine. Quite like how that one's looking. And while that one is settling in and the paint's starting to dry, can you see right here, the charge has stopped right there where the paint's too dry. Don't fuss with something like that. If you get a wet brush and try and blend it in, you'll have a disaster. The best thing to do is just leave that alone. And when this is all dry, I'm going to put a dark shadow over the top and you won't even notice that. Right, we're going to do the exact same thing on this one back here. I'm, I don't think I'm going to have the hard highlight on this one. I just want a soft highlight because it's in the background. The hard highlight on this one in the foreground gives it more detail, pulls it into the foreground, but I just want a soft one here. So same thing, I'm gonna get some of that raw sienna, or if you don't have raw sienna, yellow ochre is a good one. They're both an earth color. I'm gonna put that on the top of my beetroot. I'm gonna soften it down with a wet brush. I need all the time, you need to be making a bit more paint. Don't let it get too thin and watery. Put some Prussian in there. And I have, to, I have to be really, really careful not to lean my arm into things. I'm bad at that. And come around. I need a bit more water with my paints, not flowing well enough. Mm 
and I can hear what sounds like the rain coming down. Oops, oh, I've got a big splat on my paper there. I'm, I'm just so messy. Come around the beetroot, come around into that area where that was wet. Going to fix that with my thirsty brush in a minute. I've got too much paint there, but I'm going to pull some back. I'd rather get the paint on and pull it back than worry about it right now. Now I don't want to touch, I don't want to touch the root to this one that could be a little bit wet here. I'll finish off that root later. And a bit round at the right. I've lost a bit of the highlights. I'm going to wash my brush, dry my brush, and recapture some of that highlight. Do you see how I made a round motion with my brush? It came in the shape of the beetroot coming around. Wash, dry, let's put that in. I don't want to do too much. If I do that too much, I'm going to get some nasty looking edges. Let's get just ultramarine blue this time and charge in a little bit of shadow here, here. And I'm not going to spray this one because that would be too messy. I don't want to spray this one later. And I do want the, I want the stems to be a much lighter looking color than the beetroot. So I'm going in for just my, I'm going to get some of my permanent rose. And I would like to do the stems with the permanent rose. It's kind of like the light is shining through the stems. And I want them to be lighter than the beetroot color. Permanent rose is lovely for that. And if you wanted to add a little bit, if you want to add a little bit of warm red to that, I'm just going to grab a little bit of cadmium red into that rose. Because sometimes where the sun's shining through those stems, it might be even, even lighter. We've got a variety of colors. I can put darker stems on, add a little bit of raw sienna. I can put darker stems on later so that I have a variety. And that pink has bled into that raw sienna a bit. That doesn't matter. I am going to later on put some deeper violet shadows in here that will cover that up. You might notice that right here where I've sucked up the paint with my thirsty brush. It's gone a little bit hard, dried a little bit. So I'm going to get a wet brush and blend that in a little bit more. I got too much, too carried away. They got too much of a wet brush, did too much thirsty brush work. But this is all looking good. It's settling into the paper. And this too is all settling into the paper. And what I will do while that's, while that is sort of drying and settling in, I'm going to use my thin, my little thin brush. And I'm going to put those lovely, lovely sort of hairy roots, those very thin roots on there. This one doesn't have many, but the ones I photographed, my photograph. I'm pretty sure the ones, ones that I photographed, especially this one, this was kind of a mess of roots. I kind of liked that look. It, it was all, it was here too, giving a real tangle. And this, this one's coming down from the one back there. A real tangle. You can also change up the color. I'm going in with a little bit of the raw sienna. Because again, when the light shines through something thin and delicate, it will it will appear much lighter, much warmer. So I put the raw sienna on and then add a little bit of the beetroot color to that. And I'm looking at looking at this picture for my inspiration here. I like doing things like roots and branches. 
And this one may have a few. I, again, I'm not touching that one yet because I don't want it to bleed into that one. We're not, we're not being as loose with that this, this week. But we're still are doing all that wet in wet, just taking a little bit of that pink up, all that wet in wet work with the, with the beetroots. Now, I had somewhere drawn, <laughs> looking for my drawing, I'll put that there too. Gonna out a little bit. Right, here we go. On this one, I have drawn the one that I have in my journal, which was much, much looser. And I did this quickly, so, so quickly. It was not thought out like that one. It was just let's put color on. So this is sort of the, the way I would do it really quickly. Color on, color. And I had a little bit of had some green. And yellow on the leaves. And let's get some green on them. And I'll show you when this is dried, how you can use the pen to really make something of this very loose painting. Get my beetroot color, take it up into the into the leaves and do some different colors on here. That's the rose, bit of the rose, bit of the alizarin. And get some of the blue color. Roots. I just did a very swirly root with that one. Now you might think, what a mess. And it does often look a mess. That's the beauty of the black pen later. And again, you can't work too much wet and wet because you'll get a mess. You have to sort of just put a bit on, a bit of the blue. I've got the blue and the Prussian here. And I'm just going to leave that to dry. That is loose. That is, that is really working with loose paint. I'm going to do a little bit of that blue right here. I'm actually going to get some of that green and mix it with that blue and have a little bit more dark in here. Maybe there. I think I had a little bit of, I had a little bit of shadow under it here. So I can't touch the beetroot with the shadow because I will mess up the paint, but I can put some of the pink and some of the green and some of them just thinking a little bit of the ultramarine just in quick. And I'm looking at this and thinking, I can just like stick a bit of that raw sienna in there quickly. That, that is loose. Now I'm gonna put that to one side to dry so that I can show you in a while how the black pen really picks all that up. So that if you want to later or even now, or whenever you feel like it, if you want to really try something that's very, very quick and loose, you can use some kind of a black pen to do your detail after this is all dry. And I'll go through some of the ones I have while I'm just waiting for that to dry. Great cheap option is the Sharpie pen. It's waterproof, the thin Sharpie, and it has a fairly thick line. Let's zoom in so we can see a little bit better. 
has a fairly thick line, but it's good and waterproof, has a lovely point. They last a long time. So I really like the Sharpie pen. That's what to, I'm going to work on this. Let me in focus. I think we're in focus. A great one is the Micron pen. These come in all sizes. This is a 05. They come in so many colors. They come in all kinds of tips. And again, they are, and this one's a 05. They are completely waterproof. You can get them in iron oxide. You can get them in Michaels. Although I bought a pack from Michaels. They were all dry. I took them back. I don't know about Michaels. I don't know how old their stuff is, but um, when I buy them from iron oxide, they're always good for maybe two or three years, maybe more than that. The watercolor paper does wear them out. They have like a fiber tip and sometimes the rough paper can wear them. These ones are made by Prismacolor. You know, Prismacolor makes the colored pencils, which Prismacolor has been bought by the Sharpie company. So probably not much different to the Sharpie company, but they come in all sizes and tips. You can get brush tips, thin tips, um, italic tips. So this is Prismacolor. And do they spell it? They only spell it with O-R. And this one is a 08. So it's a bit thicker. Again, waterproof, great little pens. I got this given to me in a lovely set. I was in Walmart the other day and there was some called Le Pen and they are made, um, I think they're made in Japan. Yeah, made in Japan, it says. And Japan makes beautiful inks and pens and different things. So I thought, well, if they had a set in Walmart, I'm going to try them and they're lovely too. This is a... Um, this is a zero point, well, it's 0 0.8 actually. Lovely, strong tips. My little set had, I think, four pens in. This is a, a 0 0.5, really great. And this lovely little bamboo pen. Oh, I love this thing. It's so much fun to use. Have to, of course, use it with a dip ink, and I like to use a water waterproof ink rather. This is Koinor uh, Design Ink. This is just black. They come in different colors too, and I particularly like this one because when it's dry, it is good and waterproof. So you dip your, you know, you. I'm sorry, but you can't see what I'm doing. You dip your pen in, and then if you press hard on your pen you get a thick line. If you don't press hard, you get a thin line. As the ink wears out, you get a different kind of line. I really like how you can get these loose lines. It has two ends. So it has a, another end here. They, they work better when you've used them a few times and washed them a few times and just wash them. And I feel I can be very, very free with my lines with this pen. Of course, you could if you found a piece of bamboo or something, just carve your own pen if you wanted to. But honestly, iron oxide has them for so little money. I have another little one somewhere. So that's that's what I like to use if I'm going to outline something with pen because it looks interesting. And let's zoom out again. There we go. Wash that. But you can just wash that little bamboo pen in your water and dry it off. Keep it clean. And it's actually quite like being washed. It keeps it supple. It doesn't dry out and split. Well, those are some choices if you need a black pen and your probably your cheapest option is just Sharpie pen and they all last a long time. So let's see, how are we doing? Let's go back here to our original. And I'm hoping that you're keeping up don't hear any questions hope everyone's doing okay don't forget if you if you do want to ask something just unmute and ask i'm happy to help this part is dry ish now um i would i would like to dry it further i'm going to one second i'm going to pause the video because i don't want um recording there we go now, you can't put wet paint on semi-dry paint, or if you do, you don't have a very nice result. 
really should, before you put a second layer of paint or a third layer, make sure the first layer is completely dry. And I prefer it to soak in quite a bit before I use the hairdryer or not use the hairdryer at all, because it's just better for the paint and better for the paper. I do not like this mark that happened here. So I want to, I'm going to use my um, alizarin. I might add a bit of rose to it just to pink it up a little bit. And I think I might go to the a different blue. I think I might go to the um, phthalo blue. Just I just want to change. I want to change in color. And I'm going to be very bold and fill in this with a, a darker shadow. Now, I have a hard edge here. I can choose to either leave it a hard edge or I can soften that hard edge with my wet brush, but I've washed it and dried it a little bit. I need to have a little bit more shadow up here, especially under the leaves here. And again, I'm going to wet my brush, dry it a little bit and soften this, soften this with my wet brush. I'm going to put some ultramarine blue into that now. Again, I like to change it up. So there's a variety of colors in this beetroot. And under here, I want to have it much darker just here under the beetroot, especially around this side and even up here where it's going to go up into the, the leaves. And if I've already wet this with my wet brush, it will charge, it will charge in. Now I'm already getting quite a, an edge here, so I have to be very quick with my brush and not very wet to soften, soften this edge so they don't get an, a hard thing happening or weird thing happening. And charge in a little bit more color there. And here I gotta soften that a little bit. Might take, I'm gonna take some rose and some alizarin and add a little bit up here, kind of a bit of a bit more reddish color up here. Maybe here. Charging a bit in here as well. We yeah, need a bit more here. Definitely need a bit more there, I think. Get deeper color and build up that color so it's richer. It's very, very difficult in watercolor to get rich color in without layers because it just, it lightens as it dries, it soaks into the paper. And you need to build, especially reds, reds and, and those kinds of colors, you need to build them up in layers. I'm just gently with my brush, taking that color into my highlight area without making too much. I'm look at a little bit more alizarin. Be very careful not to get too much water on your brush, just your pigment. I'm putting a bit more alizarin in here. I won't, I won't lose my highlight, don't worry. I can keep it and I can soften this. The more dark I put on, the lighter this area will look. And I like how in the middle here where I've got the rose and the alizarin, they're really kind of glowing now, now that I've, I've got the second layer on here. Still got a little bit of a line where I, I went up against two dry paint there. I'm going to get a bit more alizarin, a bit more ultramarine. I'm going to charge in there with that, making one of those really, really dark violets there to kind of hide where I had a, just a look that I didn't, I didn't want there. Take a little bit more down into the, the root. And the same with this one. This one is not in the foreground, but 
I want more color in it. So I'm getting the just the alizarin, I think. I don't want the pink color. I want to put more, just more alizarin on this one. Give it a bit more depth of color. And as I get up to the highlight, just with my wet brush, just blend it in a little bit. Wet my brush and blend this edge. Yeah, now this one's looking a little, a little dry on this edge, so I need to just wet it up a little bit. Add a little bit more raw sienna. Just grabbing some raw sienna, putting it here. Probably granulate nicely with that red. And if you look at the actual beetroot, there is that kind of cracked, kind of granulated look to it. Put the blue in there. So you can see now with the second layer and some of the reds and pinks, it's really, it's really starting to have some depth of color. I'm going to put a little bit more dark color under here and here. It's charging that in. I've taken some of the dark color, charged it in. Now, this really, really needs to soak in right now. And this is a, a good time to switch to the carrots. And I am, I did draw the carrots so that... I was ready, but if you need to draw your carrots, and put this somewhere where the paint's not gonna smudge or flow behind me, get my carrots in the right place. Now you probably can't see the pencil drawing because I draw them very, very lightly. But I will go to my um, journal here. And I kind of liked this arrangement of carrots where I have a diagonal and then I have a vertical and then I have a horizontal. I kind of liked that, that look to them and a very, very loose background. Again, this is made of several layers and the leaves are very loose. There is black pen around this one to make the edges stand out. And I've also used, I used um, masking fluid and white pen. Now, I think probably the best thing to do is, is use white paint or white pen afterwards. The masking fluid is very hard to uh, manipulate and make this fine. And I really love all the white paints and white pens you can put on afterwards. So don't worry about that. I'm going to go get some clean, beautiful clean water because I don't want beetroot colors on my carrots. You probably want some clean water too. And um, draw your, your three carrots ready or however you want your carrots. If you want your carrots in a different, a different organization, please feel free. Anyway, I'm gonna get some clean water. If you wanna ask a question, please do. Has anybody got a question? Anybody struggling with something? Caroline, um, I guess what I'm struggling with is my beat looks more like a balloon than a beat and trying to get more character, more beat character into it. <laughs> Um, I think that just might be that you need more. I can't see it, of course, but I think you may need more intensity of color. Let me, um, let me stop the recording. Let me just pause the recording a minute. One second. Recording. So I'm resuming the recording and we'll just have to see how it comes on on the recording. But on my laptop, I don't see anybody, just my camera. So. Uh, and I know one of the participants from week one said he'd prefer it if he saw the full screen and no people on the side. But you know how I struggle with Zoom. It does things and I don't know why it does things or why it's different to just <laughs> to just now. Don't know. My setting for the recording shouldn't show people. I, I have it set on that. So let's see how we go. And I just want to make sure that I think my camera is in focus is some, I think it's locked. 
what I love about this camera is I can lock the focus and I think that's I think that's good okay right I know you can't see the carrots very well they're sketched very lightly but as I start to paint them you most definitely will and lots of different colors this time we're going to go with yellows we're going to go with oranges you can mix your orange with a, a red and yellow, or you can use an orange that you have. If you want to make your orange a little bit darker, you just add a little bit of ultramarine blue. It will darken it up. Another really nice yellow is gamboge. That's, this is gamboge. This is a very orangey yellow. This is my azo yellow. So I might have a little bit of both here. And again, it doesn't matter if you don't have gamboge. If you add a tiny bit of rose or a tiny bit of red to your bright yellow you'll get a, a color like gamboge just it's more of an orangey yellow i want to mix an orange um looking for a clean spot this has got some purple on if i have purple and yellow mixed together i'll get a lovely brown rather than an orange so I'll try and keep that clean there we go so i'll mix some a azo yellow with some, I like this pyrrole. I don't know if you say pyrrole or pyrrole red, but pyrrole red. It's a good one. It's a nice transparent red. Get some of that there. And I put some here with some, I'll mix some cadmium with that one. I don't know. I like the, the, the pyrrole or pyrrole red is so bright. Just lovely. I'm going to mix a little bit of ultramarine blue with this one. Blue is the complement of um, orange, so it will it will dull it down a little bit just for the the shadows. I could also add a little bit of burnt sienna just for the shadows on the carrots. So I'm going to start with the yellow on this one, and the the side up is sort of the, the bright side of the carrot. And again, as you put your paint on, it doesn't matter if you leave a few little white areas showing because we're going to add quite a few white areas later. Have this coming to here. I'm going to work on them sort of one at a time. Because what I want to do now is take the orange mix, get my orange mix, and put that on while the yellow is still wet. So they mix together. The orange is going to be on the underside here. So that's going to be more in shadow. And you might wonder why would you put yellow on first if carrots are mostly orange? It's just to really give it that round look, that lovely sort of highlighted look. And once your orange has started bleeding into your yellow, you won't have much yellow showing. I add a little bit more red as I went down here to my orange to get it a bit richer. Red and pink, they always look really rich when you put them on the paper. And they're colors that really fade very quickly as they dry. So that's why quite often you need two or three layers of them before you get a richness of color bit more orange in my tray, come down here. And you can see the orange is really bleeding over into the, into the carrot. And if I want a little bit more shadow, I have the orange here that I added a little bit of the ultramarine and burnt sienna to. I might add a little bit more ultramarine. Not too much, you don't want a really dark brown but I'm going to put a little bit of that, just a little bit charging it just in up here and, and under here, just, just to give a little bit of shadow to that side. Gently tease that back a bit with my thirsty brush. Now I'm gonna do the one behind now with the same sort of method. The only thing you have to be careful of is not sort of getting too, well, it doesn't really matter if you get too much bleeding between the carrots, but it's kind of nice if you have some division between them. And sometimes you can 
manage that by having just the tiniest of dry spots between the two, so tiny you can hardly see, hardly see the dry line. But what will happen if you if you put your dark orange on this one now, you'll get all the dark orange bleeding into your your light side of your carrot, and then they'll all end all your three carrots are gonna end up the same dark orange. So we're sort of just getting our base color on here. At the top here where it's not touching, it's not touching the other carrot at the top. I'm going to put some of the orange on there. And down the bottom here, it's not really touching down here. Take my yellow. Lovely thing is if you have the yellow on there, even if you cover most of it up by the end, you still have that lovely warm, that warm glow. You can put more orange on if you feel you haven't got enough. I'm actually feeling, as I'm looking at it and it's sort of blending in, I'm just feeling I want a bit more at the top here. I'm going to go round, like I said, in the direction of the carrot going round. And it doesn't even matter if I see lines because you know carrots, you often see lines going around them. And we're going to put some white lines in. I'm going to put a bit more here. This orange is very heavy on red at the moment that I'm putting on. And we can do the same thing with the hairy roots if we need to. If you feel like your carrots are ones you've pulled out the ground rather than the nice clean ones from the supermarket, you can put some of those little roots on them. Really, really delicate. Now this one here behind doesn't have enough orange on yet, but I will add some when the other one is has dried a little bit. Put some over here. A little bit of orange, more orange on my brush. And I might, when this one behind is dry, I might want to put a little bit more shadow on it because when something is behind something else, it shouldn't really be as bright or as warm so that it fades into the background. But I can add that shadow later. Again, I'm going to go in this sort of motion with my brush to give the look of lines going around the carrot like this way. And I haven't, the paint hasn't touched. There's just a little white space between those carrots where the, the paint hasn't touched. And because of that, because it's not touching, I should be able to come in and gently stroke some orange lines in that won't bleed into the yellow in front of it. Yeah, layer number one, the carrots. Now we can definitely go on and put in the uh, leaves for the carrots without having too, ma too much happening with the the bleeding or anything like that. So again, you're going to use the yellow and just mix a lovely spring green. You can mix so many different colors with it. I'm thinking what color, I think maybe Windsor blue, it will make it very nice and bright. We can put some darker green on later, but the Windsor blue, I don't even think it needs a darker green than that. I put a little bit, little bit of Windsor blue, pull that over a little bit, little tiny bit of Windsor blue with the yellow that I had, the azo yellow. And I've made a very, very light green. And again, I can put darker green on later, <clears throat> excuse me, but I really need to start with the light greens. And bringing up those green stems. It doesn't matter if that green bleeds down into the orange a little bit. I'm even gonna encourage that because we're doing these very loose wet in wet paintings. 
with some leaves coming up and off the edge here. Added a little bit more yellow, want to get some light to it. And where the, the leaves on the carrots are very lacy, aren't they? I'm just gonna kind of like dot a little bit more water on my paintbrush. Kind of kind of like dot with my paintbrush to get some of that lacy look to the leaves. And I kind of pull them down here as if they're like hanging down and just dot with my paintbrush. And that's that's your light leaves. Now we can put the dark ones on right now. Oh, I forgot this one down here. Hang on a minute. I got to get this, this little guy down here with these leaves coming out here. Now we're going to work wet and wet so we can put some dark leaves on. I will make a darker green by adding some ultramarine blue to that light green I have. So we've got the phthalo blue and the azo yellow, and now I'm adding some ultramarine blue to that to darken it up a little bit. If I add more phthalo blue, I will get a very vibrant green, which is really pretty, but I think I want a more dull green to complement the very bright yellows and bright oranges. So I've got this darker dull green and I'm going to like charge it in here just a little bit so it's going in near the the root here and then just pull pull a couple of strands of dark up not obliterating the light but just you know adding a little bit of complement a little bit of shadow and I'm going to wash my brush and add a bit of water to that mix and maybe a bit of yellow so it's not quite so dark I don't want it really light, but I don't want it quite so dark. And add a little bit more, a little bit more texture to the, the feathery tops with a little bit more dark, but not super dark. Yeah, we've got all that going on. They need to dry. They need to dry before we do anything else to those because we don't want any dark shadows bleeding into the lovely bright paint and sort of making really muddy looking carrots. I just want to do a little bit more. And also the background that I did was a very light blue layer first, and then I put lots of um, other colors in. You can actually, if you wanted, right now you could put... See what I'm doing? I'm putting the orange in and getting a wet brush and then I'm just kind of like um, blending it in a little bit. And that color will show through the blue and you can put a little bit more on top afterwards and get a little bit of yellow. The thing is to have in these shadows in the background, some, some of the colors you're using, a little bit of the green, but not as not as intense, really watered down. Like I've watered it down. I've used a wet brush to blend it in. And then if they dry and then we put blue on and then we put a bit more color on, you're going to get that lovely layered look of all different colors in the background that complement the blues, will complement the carrots. So um, we need to let them dry a little bit and we can go back to our beach roots. Let's put that to one side. Now your beetroot should be, by now, they should be dry enough to work on the uh, leaves and the red spray. If you, do have a, if you do have a spray bottle, and what I want to do is grab a piece of paper towel. Now you can use a cloth, a clean cloth, a clean piece of paper or a paper towel. And I just want to put that over the beetroot so I don't, you know, I don't spray them too much with water because what I want is just a couple, just two sprays there so that I can put that red up there and it sort of bleeds into the spray. Probably won't happen this time, probably happened just great just now and I'll probably not cooperate this time. I'm going to go back to my Alyssa and Crimson and pull that up from the stems into the 
the wet area. It's going to close the door. Sorry about that. There's nothing you can do about somebody phoning your husband when you're in the middle of a video at home. That's the only thing. But we get much better connection than Oliver Wood. So what we lose with the lack of privacy we gain with a good connection. So I've just sort of put those um, stems coming up into the water and I'm going to get my thin brush and the crimson and I, I'm going to just put on a few of the, I haven't got the leaves there yet, but I will be having some veins coming into those, those leaves when I put them on. And I have very bright stems at the moment. And when they're dry, I can add, like up here, I can get some darker. I'm going to go into my darker mix. And I'm going to put some darker ones on in between those light stems up here. And I'm also going to put some veins. I'm going to put some leaves there too. And I know the leaves aren't that close to the actual beetroot. Sometimes you just have to take a bit of artistic license if that's the size of paper you've got, or if you don't want a massive piece of paper before you get to the leaves. I'm going to look at, where is my beetroot? Here it is. So we've got a variety of greens here. We've got quite a light green, but it's not really bright. It's a olivey green. And we've got some quite quite dark greens here. So we can start with a bit of a sort of a light olivey green and then move into the darker ones. And we don't have to be too literal, that's for sure. Um, light olivey green, what can we use? Well, if I put some raw sienna, raw sienna with some sap green, I get a light olivey green. Or if you don't have a sap green, you can mix is a mix of yellow, mix yellow and blue. I mean, just pick a blue. Ultramarine blue is going to give you a gentler green and a little bit of raw sienna. And that gives you a more of an olivey green. So I'm going to put a little bit of that on for some of the leaves. Not in any big shape here, just a, you know, we've got a bit of green here make a leaf. Here's quite dry. So right here, I think I'm going to put an olivey green leaf where it's quite dry. I'm going to have to wait a little bit for some of these up, up here to dry more before I can put them. If I want to make this green more intense, I'm going to add some ultramarine blue. I, I can use, I really like sap green, only the Daniel Smith. Daniel Smith is the only sap green I like and mix it with some ultramarine blue. And that gives me a much darker green. And I'm going to, it's a little bit dry up here. So I'm going to put some leaves up here. And I, I just got to wait to put a few of the others in. I think my beetroot has got enough paint on and good deep color. It's looking fine. Where's my... I'm gonna grab, oh, okay, I'm gonna grab this one. This one here that I did really, really quickly and loosely. And I'm actually, I'm, I would normally use my bamboo pen. I, I will. That's, I think I, I'm a bit messy with it. That's the only thing I'm thinking. What can I do to not make too much mess? <laughs> it's inevitable. I'm, I'm hopelessly messy. We'll put that there. I tend to spitter and spatter with it. There we go. Right, so I'm going to dip my bamboo pen in that. I just really love drawing with this bamboo pen, especially on a watercolour. Oh. And... The reason is I don't I don't draw carefully with it because it's not a careful drawing instrument. So I can be very, very loose. Maybe that's not a good thing. I don't know, but um, I find my lines are just 
just more interesting. I can do the edges. The leaves get very, they're very ordinary shaped leaf, but they get really curled up. Dipping into my ink, and I have this. I'm just doing the sort of the, the roundness very quickly. A bit of the shadow. Of course, if you don't feel confident with a, a you know this sort of pen. You can draw much more carefully with, with one of the other pens, a Sharpie pen or something, if you want to do the, the lines around the leaves and the beetroot. It just kind of pulls the whole thing together. Same with the carrots. When we do all the lines, it really pulls the whole drawing together. And makes the carrots stand out from the background and everywhere else. So. So not, not only is my, my paint loose for my beetroots, my pen lines, just by having to use this pen because I can't control it very well, are loose too. And I don't, I don't like stick to the edges of the paint. I invent my own edges and the paint goes over them. And that's all kind of like fun, I think. I can put a little bit of roundness to the beetroot here, a bit of shadow. Maybe some of those hairy roots. And that's all I really need to do, but it, it, just, it just picks it up, doesn't it? it? It makes everything stand out. And if I... I, this one here, I just I didn't fill in all of the area with paint. I just left some of it skipped white paint. I really like that look too. I wish I had a little bit here that was a bit skipped with the with the paint, but that's okay. That's that's uh, that's that's your real loose one. If you want to really really practice being loose with your paint and your pen. Do something like this after you've done your really tight beetroot. You know, draw your beetroot carefully and then just try and slap your paint on as fast as you can and see, just see what you get. And if it if it doesn't look that great, use a, you know, use a Sharpie pen or something to really pick it up again and get your outline. I think you might be surprised at what you can achieve doing it that way. Right, let's go back to, hmm. yeah, my beetroots are still real pretty wet. And again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause the video because I want to use the hairdryer in recording. There we go. I'll forget one day. I'll be so sad if I forget one day, won't I? Okay, so now I've um, that's dry, so I can go in with a bit more of the leaf color and do a bit more work on that. Get some yellow in in the leaf i want to i have my one here from last time and i'm gonna put a little bit oh, a bit more yellow in there maybe just I'll bring this over i have that green that i mixed and what i do when i'm mixing a color is i add like i add more yellow to one side and more blue to the other side i don't mix a lot of different puddles just sort of modify what I have. I'll turn it around so you can see better what I'm doing. And I want the sort of yellowy green for some of these leaves in here and maybe here. And on my other one, I put some down here I, and I, I don't know, sometimes this whole area that's not got anything in makes me feel like I need something there. And I put some, sort of splodgy green in and I'm not sure I like that it's hard to decide isn't it really hard to decide I'll show you what I can do and it may not work so you may not want to do it <laughs> and I don't mind if it doesn't work on mine because I'll just do another one I'll be doing another one tomorrow for the live class so it's uh, neither here nor there 
I think it's really good not to get too precious about your paintings or hung up on them. If you if it doesn't work and you feel like it, do another one. And try it again if you feel like it. Now, what I'm going to do with this, because I feel like this, I've got a big dense green space up here and this is all empty. I'm going to try something. I'm just going to try something with this. I'm going to wet all this area. Like I said, this may not work and I may decide tomorrow to do it differently. I just feel I want something down here, but I don't have a plan. And I'm going to get some of that really light yellowish green. And because my paper's wet, and if I put the green on the wet paper, it will lighten it even more. So I have a really, really nice sort of. And the reason I'm using green is because I have a red beetroot. Green and red are complements. And every time you use a complement in the painting, you are making the colors sing. The colors work with each other. So I've got wet paper very light yellowy green there and I kind of think I like it not totally sure about it yet because it's not dry but I think I might like it I'm going to add a little bit of blue to that end a bit of the sap green and add a little bit more um, dark to some of these beetroot leaves I don't want to I don't want to do too much it's really easy to to go wild and do way too much. And I also, on this, on this one here, I have some quite dark stems as well. So let's, um, I'm gonna go to a number two brush, alizarin crimson, just alizarin. I think it's just a gorgeous color for beetroots. And I think I'm going to add Going in there, just some darker stems. I'm gonna add a little bit of ultramarine blue to that. Just get it a tiny bit darker. And it's like the trees that we did last week. You don't need to see, stop putting your finger in that, Caroline. You don't need to see the whole stem. You can see it coming in and out from behind the other stems, in and out from behind the leaves. And I have some coming off the page, a few of those. And I think that's, too, if I do any more, it's going to be way too much. I think I'm really pushing the limits of what I can do there. And sometimes if you don't like what you've done when you're finished, you can go back and you can scrub a bit out and redo what you did. But that, I think that is enough for a small painting. What's always lovely is because you have such a mess with the tape, of course. It's always lovely when you take off the tape. I think it's at least dry enough to do that. And you get the nice clean, nice clean edge showing. And then it really, really makes it look so much better than when you have that messy tape there. I already I'm more I'm more pleased with how that looks, just having a, a nice clean edge to it and and if you want to if you want to back it onto something onto card i would suggest for the light green and the deep red a nice a nice, nice deep green background is really perfect for this if you wanted to back it to make a little picture make a little card make you know if you wanted to make a set for the kitchen and put three up some nice, lovely dark green would look beautiful. But let's go back to the carrots. Quite. Sometimes you need to, I know a couple of people have said to me, you're right, you need to look at it a couple of days later because the paint really does settle in and change after it's dried for a couple of days. And you're not so close to, not so close to what you're doing after a couple of days, you've got some perspective. Let me feel those carrots. They're still a little damp, so I'm going to do the whole, like, let's pause the... Okay, so I just dried it a little bit with the hairdryer. And uh, I want to work on the background. The carrots may need a little bit more work on them, but let's get a nice, quick 
background in first. And just like I did with the other one, you need to wet, not the carrots, definitely don't wet the carrots. You need to keep them nice and dry, but I'm going to wet around them because I want the background to be super light. I don't want to um, overtake the color of the carrots. They've got to be the brightest thing in the painting. Now, I haven't checked my notes in over an hour. Check what I'm talking about over here. So A's of yellow, cadmium red, A's of cadmium red, time touch, orange, marine blue, that's all good. And then uh, Azo and sap green for the carrot tops. And I've said a wet and wet background using mostly ultramarine blue. Now, I'm not sure if I didn't use, whoops, I think I might have used a slightly lighter blue. Let's have a look. Hmm, I don't know. I think I might have used a very watery ultramarine on the background. I was wondering if I'd used a, a cerulean, because cerulean is really nice with orange. And I'm wondering what to do now. Let's well, if I use ultramarine, it's got to be pretty light. And I might just add, might just add a touch of cerulean into it. Oh, sorry, I've got my board around the wrong way. So I put got some ultramarine. I'm going to put a little touch of cerulean into it so it cools it down a little bit and really water it down. I do not want this paint to be bright. I want it to be very, very watery. You know what I did there? I dripped water on this. And I'm not going to paint over the carrots, remember, and I'm not going to wet the carrots. Put this watery mix. And if at any point you feel this blue is too dark, too much darker than the carrots, add more water to your blue. It's got to, this got to fade into the background. I went over the carrot there. My. Thing is, you know, you can be loose, but you also have to be careful as well. And sometimes you can only be loose when you've painted something very tightly a few times to start with so that you have a kind of a muscle memory of where the paint goes and what colors you use. So that when you do go to the loose paint, I've got over the carrot again there, then you kind of remember where all the colors go. So you don't have to stop and think about it too much and you can be a bit more free. So that ultramarine with a little bit of cerulean that I put on there is very, very watery onto wet paper. And you see how that kind of fades into the background, but it gives, it gives that that little bit of blue to set off the orange and be a bit more careful than me. I've gone a bit over the edges here, a bit carried away. I also want to, while that's there, I'm going to put a get a bit of that green and just put a little bit more here and there. And get some of that green with some ultramarine. It's over here. Oops, I got the wrong green there. That's a bit, and I might put a bit more dark into this, this wet in wet up here. I've got the wet. I've got some sap green and some ultramarine blue. And I'm charging in up here, charging, you know, like dropping in just a little bit of um, dark green onto those carrot tops. It makes them very fuzzy. And I think if I just get some azo yellow on my brush, I'm just getting, I didn't even, haven't made a puddle or anything. I just got wet brush, a little bit of azo yellow. I'm thinking if I just tip that onto that ultramarine blue background here and there, I'm gonna get a kind of a greeny, yellowy look to some of those leaves. It's gonna be kind of interesting. And just here, maybe a little bit more of that orange. Right, okay, that's good. Don't want to overdo that. Now, when I was talking about the shadow on the 
carrots. They're all pretty much the same value right now. I want the one in the foreground to be nice and bright. And remember, I haven't touched this carrot with any water or background color. So I'm going to get a little bit of ultramarine blue and mix it with a little tiny bit of burnt sienna. Remember to show you my palette. Ultramarine blue. I'm going to have to be very, very careful with this. I want, I want to put a little bit of too much. So it's too dark. I've got to wet my brush and just. Now this, this color is an extremely light bluish gray. And I am very gently putting a bit of shadow on there. And with a wet brush, just still diluting it just a little bit and pulling it around. It will dry lighter. You always have to remember that, that the paint looks dark when you put it on, but it will dry lighter. And I want to have a shadow behind the foreground carrot and here too on this background one. I'm going to, I have over here, I've got the orange with the blue and the burnt sienna as a sort of a brownish color. I'm going to use a bit more of a brownish orange here. Just to put that one, make it go behind this one. The blue will always dull down the orange, but it will still look authentically orange. If you start putting, if you try and put darker orange on or, or dark brown, it just looks muddy. It doesn't look like shadow or a darker orange. It's unusual that way. The complement will look much more natural. So I'm going to a little bit of ultramarine blue again here, tiny bit of that brownie orange. And I want to do the same to this one, get that behind, have some shadow on the underside of that one. And with my wet brush, just pull that in and pull the lines around so you see some of the lines I can have up here, even darker, with that dark green up there. I'm going to darken up this green here too, just put the dark. Ultramarine, ultramarine blue is great. It's, it's just so great for darkening up all of your colors and putting in shadows. I'm putting some ultramarine blue in that green up here. It's darkening up a little bit. Go back to my kind of gray orange. And same with this one, I'm going around, putting those shadowy lines on. Wet brush, let's just blend them in. Gonna get a little bit more, a little bit more orange to mix with that bluey color, that bluey gray color. And hopefully that kind of will push those other carrots behind the foreground on this one here. I can still have a little bit of shading on that one, but I just don't want to do as much shading as the background carrots. If I do want to have some extra shading on this one, that's when you can use the more, some more orange, say. So I'm mixing the red and the yellow for a bit more orange, a bit more red in there. Because this one's in the foreground, if I put the warm colors on this one, it's really going to stand out. I'm going to put a very, very reddish orange on there to make that one stand out a little bit more. But not on the background ones. All brown there. Now, again, they're, they're very little paintings, so you don't want to do too much in the way of detail. The blue right now is too wet to put any orange or yellow um, shadows on. But when the blue is completely dry, you can put some loose orange and, and yellow shadows. Where's my book? 
my carrots here. So if you actually put them side by side, if you actually look at this one, I've put another layer of ultramarine blue down here and quite a bit of orange into the shadows, which has formed sort of browns with the ultramarine blue. And right here, I've just put water so it kind of bleeds right here. So this is the background is not as dark as this background for sure. I don't want to put it on while this is still wet. It really needs to go on when this is dry. And what I'd like to do now, let's see what time is, it's 3.30. So I'd like to dry this with the hairdryer and just put on the, the pen and the white highlights to sort of uh, finish it up. The pen, the black pen, of course, will be waterproof and um, the white highlights on the carrots shouldn't be affected when I put the, the background in later if I put it in. So let's do the, the pausing, um, pause hairdryer right there. So I've dried that and I'm going to use, um, let's see what I've got here. Uh, point, point 0.5. What ones have I got? Um, zero 0.5. Got so many different, this one should be okay. I'm going to have a look at the one that I did quite a few years ago now in the book here, just so I have a, a reference beside me. And uh, this is where you really can pick up, you can really pick up the carrots when you get a pen and put in the detail. It means you can be very loose with your brush strokes because you can pick up all the detail later with your pen. And that's, that's pretty helpful. Even things like the, the lines around the carrots you can put in with your pen. And I kind of like them not to be perfect carrots. They're, they're more like the ones you, you know, you grow in the garden. They're a bit knobbly, a bit weirdly shaped. Got some, sometimes I like it when, the, you know, the, the point here kind of splits off. I put that in deliberately, kind of like that look. And I'm just using my pen to put those lines that go around the carrot. You can double up your lines on the shaded side if you want. If I go quiet, so I, I, I need to concentrate sometimes. It's sometimes hard to, to do this and chat at the same time. Need the other bit of my brain. Um, what I'm gonna have here, I'm gonna have like a little root sticking out. I think these carrots were from the garden, the original ones I photographed. And they did, they were very irregular. They had lots of bits, roots sticking out. And the tops on. They always look so pretty with the tops on, don't they? And keep those really delicate. They're kind of like ferny, sort of frondy things, aren't they? So I'm just tapping with my pen to make those frondy bits and not make them too um, distinct. Sometimes you just need to you just need to give the viewer some clues. And it's very nice for someone observing art when their brain or their imagination can do some of the work and fill in some of the details that you've left out. It's not a conscious thing. It's just something that a lot of our brains like. So if you want to, you can put in a little bit of your, you know, sort of shadow underneath. Uh, I've got my black pen in. Now white, there's so many options for white. The Uni, Uniball writer, Signal Uniball is really great. 
The new one on the market is the Posca pen. Everybody, I've heard so much about the Posca pen. I didn't find it that exciting having heard so much about it, but I got one anyway. Uh, I quite like the Jelly Roll pens. They're only a couple of dollars each and they're pretty good. They come in all sizes too and they, they do quite a nice white line. Oh, I got a piece of white paper to, to show you all of them. It's not white paper, it's black paper. See, my brain's gone. Uniball. So this is the Uniball. It's old, so it's a little bit scratchy, this one. Sometimes if you want to get them running again well, is for some reason just running them on your skin seems to really loosen them up and get them flowing again. I don't know if it's the, the warmth of the skin or what it is, but it does seem to work if they get a bit jammed up. This is the, uh, the jelly roll one. And these come in a lot of different sizes. And this is a 08. The Uniball, um, I forget what size this is. It's not as clear. Oh, yes, it is. It's 0 0.7 millimeters. OK, so this is the um, Posca. Now, see, I was not, I'm doing it again. I'm not that impressed with it, really. People have raved about them online, and I don't find it anywhere near as nice as the Uniball or the Jelly Roll. Who knew? Anyway, this is the General's Charcoal. Yeah, let's have an apostrophe. I quite like that, but of course it's difficult to go over paint with that. This is um, this is a Conte, so it's more oily. And then I have um, M. Graham's white gouache or gouache. You can say it either way, gouache or gouache. Uh, I have a little pen here. And that's very opaque. And my all time favorite is Dr. P.H. Martin's white. And I quite often, I have a little tray and I put some in a little tray here and a little bit of water and it's always in there and it dries up and then you can, it's just like the paint, you can moisten it again. So this is the, so this is the Dr. P.H. Martins, I just put Dr. P.H.M. I just find this is the most opaque, the easiest to paint with. Uh, it's quite expensive. This little pot cost me $16.95. My other pot was $12.95. I think I gave it away. It was half used and I gave it to someone. But they last for years and years and years and years. And um, you, you can just reconstitute them with water. So even if it gets a bit thick, you can put water with it and it's lovely. So I'm going to use, I'm going to use that. It's still my favorite. But if you have a white pen, you know, if you want to use a white pen to put a few highlights on your carrot, a few roots, if you want to, you don't have to. I really like a small brush and uh, my Dr. P.H. Martin's white. A few lovely little wiggly roots, just because, and some highlights. And like I said, I think I did this originally with masking fluid before I started, but I find masking fluid extremely difficult to control and paint with. It gets thick and gummy and gooey. And I prefer these days, now that Dr. P.H. Martins is on the market, I prefer to just use that to put the whites in afterwards. So much easier. You can paint them easily with a, a little paintbrush or a, a, a pen. If you have a dip pen, you can do that. Where's my dip pen? Here it is. Okay. Going to get, we've got a slightly bigger brush. This is a dip pen. And I get some of that white. And I'm going to paint it onto a dip pen. Iron Oxide has dozens of different dip pens and nibs. Paint it right on there. 
the, and again, the good ones are the Japanese nibs, and I think they're two or three dollars. They're not expensive. I paint a bit of white on that nib, and then I can just um, use it like a pen. What well, is the pen? You know, like one of these pens, and that gives you a much much finer line. Sound? Can you hear how scratchy that sounds? It's supposed to sound like that. There's nothing wrong with that. And you can buy a pack of pack of nice little um, Japanese drawing nibs from iron oxide if you wanted to do that, if you're into that. But the nice thing is you can use all, your, all of your paints with it. Any color paint you like. I use paints with it a lot. So where's my piece of black paper? So if I wanted to use a different color paint, say I want to use a um, phthalo blue, I'm gonna put that with the white so I have a, a lightish blue. So I can use any color of my watercolor paints in my pens just by painting the paint onto the pen which I think is such a revolutionary idea. It just blows me away that you can do that. Looking for, looking for a decent piece of white paper. Um, last thing, we're nearly done, aren't we? It's gonna go into some nice red here. paint and pens changed my life anyway let's stop the video there thank you for joining me i might have to edit the last little bit out uh, let's pause the re pause the